Okay, hello and welcome to a Paro seminar. Uh, basically, I do these seminars once a month and they're designed to explore the theory and the technology of Paro theology. Basically, what I try to do in these seminars is mine uh, the personal and the political uh, resources of this approach to Christianity. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, Paro theology is a non confessional, religionless reading of Christianity. Um, or even, it's a way of approaching Christianity that sees Christianity as itself fundamentally non confessional and religionless. And in Paro theology, Part of the idea is that conversion is not an embrace of a worldview. So, you know, we think of conversion as you move from Christianity to Judaism, or Judaism to Buddhism, or Buddhism to Islam, or Islam to humanism. These are seen as conversions. But what I want to argue tonight is that, in a sense, conversion in its most radical sense is conversion from the need for conversion. Uh, it is the uh, removal of worldviews entirely. So it's not, Christianity isn't a religion or a religious perspective or a religious worldview, but in a sense the radical subversive core of Christianity is breaking free from the pantheon of gods that rule our lives, sacred and secular gods, because gods are everywhere. The world is full of gods, uh, gods of hedonism, gods of capitalism, gods of religion. Uh, there are all sorts of gods that we are trying to please in our lives, but we're trying to satisfy frantically in our, in our everyday lives. So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about how Christianity is, in a sense, the death of this entire way of being. So to start with, um, the whole point of this seminar is called an atheist atonement. So I want to look at atonement theories. Now, within the confessional church, uh, the atonement is connected to things like you know, the ransom theory, where God and the devil are in a kind of a cosmic chess match. Um, the devil looks like he's won the game, um, and then God basically pays a ransom to the devil and wins back everybody. Or there's a substitutionary atonement theory, or there's the moral example theory. These are all attempts to try to work out what does this crucifixion mean? What is the meaning of this symbol in Christianity? And that is kind of a central theological question. What is the meaning of the crucifixion? How are we to interpret this? doesn't have any meaning whatsoever. But it's not just the confessional church that's had an interest in this. So what I want to offer is a religionless reading of the crucifixion. Uh, what I think it could be uh, read to mean, it's existential import, it's value to you whether you're a theist or an atheist, agnostic or whatever. So to do that, I want to start by looking at subjectivity. I want to start by looking at some basic uh, terms that are connected with our birth into reality, birth as subjects into the world. So the first thing to say is this, that when you're an infant, when you're a child, <coughs> There's a, there's a sense in which, before about three months of old, there is no subjectivity, there's no sense of self. You and your mother are kind of intertwined. I mean, you come physically from a body, but also in your first few months of life. It's, it's not possible really to talk about the child or the mother separate from each other. There is this kind of symbiotic kind of oneness. And there's a point called the mirror phase where the child begins to create distance from the, from the mother. There is this kind of distancing between mother and child. The first demand that is given to the child is you have to you know, separate from your mother. You have to be a self. Now this doesn't always happen, and if it doesn't happen, then psychotic symptoms are the result. Um, psychotic problems kind of result if the mother and child don't, don't separate psychically uh, in an appropriate way. But this begins to happen, and so th this is the first demand of the child, you know, that you have to go off and find your own way. Now, what's interesting about this is children, infants, are surrounded by demands. Not just the demands to be separate from their primary caregiver, but you know, when to go to the toilet, when to eat, when to do this, when to do that. Your life is, is you're enmeshed in demands. But one of the difficult things is that demands are slightly different from desires. You're always given demands, 
But the demands that you're given aren't necessarily the desire of your parent. So basically, when you separate, the child experiences what's called alienation. They feel that I'm, I am distant from my primary caregiver, let's say it's the mother. I'm distant from my mother. And I want my mother's desire. The most precious resource for any child, and actually the most precious resource for anybody, is the desire of those we desire. Right? The thing that's worth more than gold, the thing that's worth more than health, more than anything else, the thing we desire more than anything else is the desire of those that we desire. So the child, as they are alienated from their parents, they desire the desire of their parents. They desire the desire of their mother. It's a very natural thing. And they're given demands what they should and shouldn't do. But the demands aren't necessarily the desire. So, I mean, at a very simple level, um, uh, this, my mum told me a story the other day about when she was a kid, she, she had a, what do you call that? Catapult. catapult, thank you. She had a catapult and she was, you know, firing the catapult to knock something off a wall and the stone hit the window and smashed this window of the next door neighbours. And when her dad came home, her dad shouted at her. So the demand was you should not do that. But she said that there was like a glint in his eye. Like there was a little smile that he was kind of barely holding back. So what was being said was the demand was don't smash the window. But the desire was, well, is that really true? Like, is there something about that that you actually liked, right? Or if uh, your kid, you know, you, you beat somebody up, you hit somebody in school and you're brought back and you say to your parents, uh, they stole something off me. And your parents says you shouldn't, you shouldn't use violence uh, to sort out your problems. But there's just the way, something the way they're saying it, it's almost like they're kind of a bit proud of you. The demand is you shouldn't do that, but the desire is good on you. Or the other way around, you don't hit the kid and, you know, your parents find out that you were being bullied and they say, well, I'm glad you didn't sort this out through violence. And maybe there's something in what, how they're saying it that just gives you the impression that they wish you kind of punched them, right? So, and, and we have this as adults. When you love someone, you have the demands. I want, I want to meet you. I want to go for coffee with you. I want what this or that. You have the demand, but then you have the desire. Why are they meeting me? What do they really want? Right? They say they love me, but do they really love me? So there's something in language where there's always slippage between demand and desire. And the more neurotic you are, the more you feel this difference between what people say and what are they really saying? What are they really wanting? So very early experience is the experience of the difference between demand and desire. And they're kind of interlinked, but they're kind of different. So for example, if I say to somebody, I want you to leave, you say to your partner, I want you to leave and never come back. That's the demand. But the desire might be, I want you to fight to stay, right? So it's actually the very opposite of the demand. You know, I don't want you to contact me. I don't want you to contact me as a demand, but you're sitting there going, but is that the desire? What's the desire? My fantasy, at its most basic <coughs> level in psychoanalysis, Fantasy is the attempt to stop up the gap between demand and desire. Fantasy is the way to try to work out how do I fit in the desire of the one that I desire. So kids start to fantasize. They play rules, they play games, they dress up as princesses or soldiers or anything like that. And in many ways, it's not that they desire that. What they're trying to figure out in this play is how can I be desirable to the other? How can I fit into the desire of the other? How can I stop up the desire of my mother or the other, whoever it is? So fantasy begins, and it's weird, and this remains, fantasy is never what you want. It's, it's kind of what you think the other wants you to be. That's why you can have fantasies that are very self-destructive on you. It, fantasies are an attempt to, to work out what what the other, what makes you desirable to the other. So when you're having a fantasy or a daydream about being rich or being famous or whatever it is, you can ask yourself, who is watching the fantasy? Who are you having the fantasy for? Because fantasies are never private. In a, in a psychoanalytic sense, you fantasize for another. You're trying to work out what makes you acceptable to some other 
How do I fit into a constellation of their desire? How can I win them over? I mean, that's why, in you know, one sense, the Oedipus complex is this idea that the child loves the mother and the father gets in the way. And they want, they want the oceanic experience of oneness. The child wants to return to some harmonious uh, oneness with the other, where there is no antagonism, there is no pain, there is no suffering, where there is just this, this beautiful experience of connecting with the source of everything that is. And that, in a sense, is symbolized by the mother. That's the Oedipus complex, that, you know, this guy wants to have sex with his mom. He doesn't know it's his mom, but it's his mom. The father gets in the way, so he kills the father, sleeps with the mother, thinks it's going to be wonderful, but it's an absolute disaster, right? Now, that's just a psychoanalytic way of saying, you want to return to some oceanic experience of oneness. You want some underlying harmony with the universe, again, symbolized by the mother. The father is the symbol of what gets in the way. You think if you get the mother, everything's going to be wonderful, but it's not, it's a disaster. When you get the thing that you want, you realize it's not what you want, right? The fantasy never holds. So that's kind of the eatable story in, in a basic way. So you've got demand, you've got desire, and you've got fantasy. Fantasy being the way to try to manage this tension between you know, what, what your parents demand of you and what they really want, what they really would like. And this is called alienation. Now the second step uh, is when you realize that you cannot be everything for the other that you cannot find a way to fully satisfy the other. You can't find a way to fully satisfy the desire of your parents. Not because of some limit in you, but because your parents' desire is not singular. Your parents' desire is not one thing. Your parents have multiple desires. They desire, you know, your, your mother desires maybe her partner, desires her job, desires holidays, friendships, all these other things. And interestingly in psychoanalysis, there's only one thing worse than uh, separating from your mother. And it's not separating from your mother, right? There's only one thing worse than realizing that, um, you know, thinking you can satisfy the desire of your mother and not being able to. And that's, that's never having that realization. Because then you're always caught up in trying to satisfy them, right? But this, there's a certain point then when things kind of go right, when you realize I can never I can never satisfy the other. I've got to live my own life. This is called separation. So alienation is when you feel distance from, say, your primary caregiver, but you want to get back. You want to find what they desire, and you want to be that desire, and you want to return to it. And that's perversion, actually, in psychoanalysis, where you think you can fully satisfy the other. Uh, and be the object of the other's demand. And then separation is whenever you realize that that is a fiction, that's an impossibility. Now, one other element of this is that also can be called de-alienation. Because as soon as you realize that you're, you're alienated from, say, your family and your family's desire, but then you realize they're alienated from their own desire. That's why Hegel said, the mystery of the Egyptians are mysteries to the Egyptians themselves. So, you know, what Hegel was saying, and I said, you think that the, the, the Egyptians know why they did all of these crazy things? But if you went back there and you asked them, they'd go, it's a mystery to us as well. Which is the Freudian way of saying that you're not just a mystery to me, you're a mystery to yourself. You're an enigma to yourself. And when I realize that, I'm going like, oh, this alienation I feel, you feel that as well. My parents feel that as well. And then you kind of, you know, you, you find your own life, you separate from the parents and adolescents, you go your own way and you, you know, you find somebody else. Now the reason why I, I paint that picture is because something similar also goes on in society. We, we, are, we are inculcated into a societal system. Uh, we are given a language, we're given a set of beliefs in an educational system, we're given a whole way of understanding our place in the world. And there are demands all around us. 
what we should do in work, how we should satisfy our employer, how we should satisfy our country, how we should satisfy our government, various, how we should satisfy our God, right? There are these demands, how we should do that. But again, there's a slight difference between demand and desire. The more you try to fulfill the demands that you feel are being made on you by society, the more you can get the sense that you're doing something wrong, that there's something else being demanded of you. Like, you know, you, you do everything your boss says you should do, but someone else gets the promotions. You're going, yeah, I'm satisfying the boss's desire, the demands, but not their desire. Or you're trying to, you know, do all of the right things in terms of, say, you know, social justice or something like that, but then you feel you're always just messing up. There's something you, you can never seem to just do everything right. And the more you try to fulfill the demands of your partner, your employer, your country, the more you can feel that something's missing. And fantasy is again how we try to resolve this conflict. So we fantasize by making lots of money or getting that promotion. We, whatever our fantasies are, our societal fantasies, our daydreams, they kind of tell us how we think we can satisfy this, what's called the big other, some societal system, some other that's making demands on us. If only we had enough money, if only we were married, if only we had kids, if only, if only, if only, if only you were able to tick some boxes, have these things and everything would be great. And that fantasy tells you, in a sense, the God that you worship. So we all worship God. You don't believe. It's not about believing in gods. We, we, we don't believe in the gods. We just worship them, right? Um, we don't, we're, we're too clever to believe in gods, but we spend all of our time sacrificing to them. Uh, you know, say getting rich or something like that, where you actually kill yourself, to, you know, wreck your health, wreck your well-being, work too hard trying to satisfy this God. Heidegger calls this the they. The they is whatever that voice is that's telling you that you have to do X, Y, and Z in order to you know, for, be fulfilled, to get that oceanic experience of oneness in order to return to some primordial state where everything's great. That, that, by the way, as an aside, I've said this before in a previous seminar, so I won't say it too much, but. But the, the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, start with an Oedipus story. Two guys, Adam and Eve, walking around a garden. There's a prohibition, and behind the prohibition there's a piece of fruit. If you eat that fruit, you will be like God, as in be whole and complete, right? You eat that piece of fruit, you will be whole and complete, because technically the definition of God is the one who lacks the lack, right? So they hear this voice and they think, if only we break through the prohibition, like Oedipus, kill the father, get through the prohibition, and get the mother for Adam and Eve, get the piece of fruit, then everything will be wonderful. They get it, but it's a curse. It's a disaster. And in the, in the Bible, the serpent is the one who says, eat the fruit and you will be whole and complete. In psychoanalysis, it's the superego. The superego is the voice that says, if only you were nicer to your parents, then everything will be great. If only you had enough money, if only you were having more sex, if only you were out more, if you were only on more Tinder dates, if it, whatever it is, the superego injunction today is usually a, not a moral one, but a hedonistic one, usually telling us that we're not having enough fun, especially in Los Angeles where I live. That's the, that's the superego injunction. You should be having more fun. You're not, you should not be sitting in on Friday night watching Netflix or sitting in Zula on Sunday night listening to a talk on philosophy. You're out there having a laugh, right? So in, the, in, in psychoanalysis, the superego is the voice that tells you you have to do X, Y, or Z in order to be whole and complete. And in theology, that's called the serpent. We think that the rule of happiness is if we obey the superego or the serpent, everything will be great. Right? But in psychoanalysis, the idea is to realize that the superego doesn't exist. The superego does not have your best interests at heart. The more you try to satisfy the demand of the superego, the more unhappy you'll be. And actually, the job is to get rid of the superego. In the same way, in theology, the idea is to exorcise the serpent. And grace is the technology of exorcism. Grace says you don't have to do anything. You don't have to fulfill anything. You don't have to do anything at all. Right? So it's the opposite of, so any community that's demanding you do something in order to be whole and complete is technically a satanic community, right? Um, or, you know, it's, 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 under the, it's under the tyranny of the superego, right? The tyranny of kind of like having to do the demands. So what has this got to do with the atonement? 
Okay, well now I want to connect it with religion, with, with Judaism and Christianity. Uh, the Jewish, the Hebrew scriptures start with this idea of the father of faith, not the very start, but they talk about Abraham as the father of faith, and they have this crazy story about Abraham and Isaac. Abraham goes up to a mountain to kill his son, you all know it, and then at the last minute God says, don't do it, here's a ram, and kills the ram instead. Now interestingly, uh, in the confessional church, there's always an attempt to read this religiously. Now, for the sake of this seminar, I want to define religion as um, that system that gives you a fantasy that tries to close the gap between desire and demand. That's ultimately what religion does, I think, is that what religion tries to do, sacred and secular religion, is it tries to offer you a way back to wholeness and completeness. And liberal theology, Schleimacher, experience the grind of being, the, the, the grind of absolute dependence, a return to oceanic experience of oneness. Religions, whether it's New Age or whether whatever, is often promising an original blessing. You can return to that, that primordial mother, that state before subject and object. So you can, you can get past alienation by going back. And what, what religion does is it gives you a fantasy, it allows you to fantasize how to do that. It creates phantasmic support to try to close the gap between the demand and the desire. You know, you're always trying to do something, you don't know what, you feel like you're, that life isn't working, you feel you're doing something wrong, you feel incomplete. What are you doing wrong? What does the other want from me? And then you fantasize what it is and you try to do those things. If you're in a church, maybe read the Bible more, <coughs> go to conferences where you beat drums in forests or whatever it is, right? You go, you know, go to the next worship conference. But if it's, if it's uh, humanism, again, it's like you'll be maybe, you're, you'll be caught up in this idea of hedonism and parties and getting out there more, whatever it is. And religion, I think, in a sacred and secular form is the attempt to help you go back to a primordial oneness before the alienation. But this is exactly the opposite of what I think is going on in the biblical text, right? Which is, I think, is irreligious. So how do you read Abraham and Isaac? Again, most people read it religiously. They try to say, well, okay, this is a story about uh, child sacrifice. So, you know, one, one explanation is it's kind of a way of saying child sacrifice is bad. Abraham goes off to kill his kid. God says, don't do it. So basically it says you shouldn't be killing kids anymore. Kill animals instead. Or it's explained as, you know, this is about the obedience of Abraham. He's willing to do whatever God wants. But, you know, Slavoj Shizek talks about this and he says, well, the interesting thing about this story is it actually beautifully articulates the, the tension of desire and demand. The demand of God is to kill your kid. But what's the desire of God? What's God want? Why is God asking that, right? This is why Soren Kierkegaard, in his book, Fear and Trembling, he wants to make the story crazy again. His whole argument in Fear and Trembling at the beginning is, in church, they want to make this story understandable. They want to take it and domesticate it. And so you can tell it, and then you can go off and you can have lunch and you know, talk about the rest of your day. Just, this is a crazy story. This is a story about killing your kid. And this is the beginning of, like, kind of, like, this is the father of faith, right? So Kierkegaard wants to make this story offensive again. And part of how you can understand that is to go, okay, this is a story that says there is the demand of God. There are these experiences of demands. But there's this enigmatic desire. We don't know what God wants. And Abraham, if you read the story, he doesn't get, he doesn't try to bridge the gap. He doesn't try to bring those two things together. He's not trying to think of a reason why. Should I really kill my son? Is that really what God wants? Abraham crazily just does it and keeps the space open between demand and desire. Now, you connect that with the second commandment. Second commandment is you shall have no graven images of God, right? You shall have no idols. The psychoanalytic way of reading that is that that's a command, you shall have no phantasmic uh, creation that tries to bring the gap between demand and desire together. Because an idol is a human attempt 
to understand God, right? An idol is to, to bring God down to a conceptual form that you can understand, to domesticate the divine. So in the Jewish religion, you have this command not to do that, not to try to close the gap between demand and desire, but to keep it open and not to create a fantastic support to close that gap. And then you go, well, how do you do that? Because that's almost impossible to endure. So how does the Jewish religion do it? Well, it does it through covenants. What is a covenant? A covenant is not designed to connect you with somebody. A covenant is designed to keep you protected from another person's desire. If you go through a divorce and you get a, a contract, the contract is there to defend against the enigmatic desire of the other, who might decide that they don't want you to see the kids, or they might not want to pay than what they're supposed to pay, right? Or if you have a business contract, the point of the business contract is not to bring you close to the business partner, it's to protect you from their fluid, enigmatic, and often contradictory desires. So that if one day they decide, I don't want you to be part of this business anymore, you can clear off. The contract protects you from the other's desire. So within Judaism, the solution to this problem of demand <coughs> and desire is covenant. God's crazy. God like drowned everybody in a in a big flood, and then God destroys cities and turns people into salt. And God could do anything. It's crazy. So what you have is a contract. We'll do this. You do that, and we'll all get on with life. And that's why within Judaism you see very little interest in God, the desire of God. Whereas a lot of Christian mystics are obsessed about what God desires and connecting with the underlying desire of God. Within the Jewish community, weirdly, which is the most, I think it's like the second most atheistic religion in the world, right? The idea is not belief in God. The idea is you just keep a kosher home, you keep to the covenant, you keep to the contract, and forget about God, right? You forget about all that. Just get on with life. So within Judaism, it's like nobody cares about the existence of God. And most of them, it's like, who cares? But I keep a kosher home. You are protected through the covenant from the enigmatic desire of the, of the divine. Now, bearing that in mind, then we go to Christianity. And uh, what I'm about to say, I think, also happens within Judaism, but uh, I think it happens in a really interesting way in Christianity, is you have this idea of God on a cross dying. And this central statement is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, interestingly, this could be seen as the point of separation. So in all religions, there is a sense of you're alienated from God for some reason, whether it's sin or it's human finitude or it's um, the cloud of unknowing, a test. You know, there's various ways of articulating why we feel separate from the desire of God, right? But it's, we're still connected. We just, we just never know it. We, whether it's because our minds are too small, we're, we're caught up in, in, in sin, or, or let's say it's a divine test, whatever it is, alienation is a central part of religion. But in Christianity, there's this idea that God is alienated from God, right? That you realize on the cross, God feels separation from God. Not that you feel separation from God, which is very, very normal, but that God feels separation from God. And at this very moment, you read in the, in the Bible, it says the temple curtain rips. And the temple curtain is set up like the Oedipal story, right? You've got the court of Gentiles, everyone can hang around, you've got a massive curtain, and behind it you've got the Holy of Holies. The temple curtain rips, which is a symbol of there is no longer a separation that you're no longer alienated from the divine. And in psychoanalysis, that experience is when you realize that you're not alienated from the other, the other is also alienated from themselves. So you can't satisfy them, you can't, um, you can't meet their requirements, you can't do anything because they are themselves riven with antagonisms. And in that moment, you are then freed from trying to please a big other. This is what Nietzsche meant by the death of God. I mean, this is a psychoanalytic reading of that. But when Nietzsche talks about the death of God, he means the freedom from some big other that continues to make demands. And by the way, when Nietzsche talked about the death of God, he wasn't talking to people who believed in God. He was talking to atheists. He said the atheists 
have not experienced the death of God because God's remain in the sense of like this this other that we're always trying to please. Kierkegaard called it the herd, that voice that we that that other world. Like when you go to club nightclubs and you don't want to go, why do you go if you don't want to go? Well, you're trying to please something, something, and what that something is, that thing that's making you feel like you should be going out and hanging out and having more fun. That's your god, right? You don't believe in it, but it actually. You know, it's you, but you still worship it. You still follow it. So the death of God is the existential experience of taking full responsibility for your life and not putting responsibility onto some other. Not trying to find out what the other wants for you and trying to obey that. It's realizing that an, an alienation and antagonism is part of existence. And when you accept that, you find freedom. So if religion is going backwards to the ground of all being to try to find harmony and wholeness and oneness, right? then a religionless Christianity is saying, no, 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 you have to go all the way into the antagonism, accept it and embrace it. And in doing that, you find freedom and you find a way to live. Not in the escape from the antagonism, but in the embrace of it. Now, let's say one other thing about this. When you're a kid, one of the things that happens is, you know, you're trying to satisfy the desire of, say, your mother. Your mother is a godlike figure. She, um, or it could be your father, it could be somebody else who's standing in for your mother. They are able to interpret your desires. They seem to be able to read your body language and respond to it. So they seem to know your innermost being. When you want to return to them, when you want to stop up their desire and be the object of their desire, um, it's you know you're you're trying to kind of one sense it's a it's a religious experience it's a religious move. As we grow, we tend to have that type of relationship with other people. And this is called transference. Transference is the experience of putting onto somebody else the idea that they know the true secrets of your heart. They know what you need. They can satisfy you, make you whole, and make you complete. Lacan calls this the subject supposed to know. You treat someone else like they, like you treated your mother when you were a child. They're a guru, become somebody, who's not just an expert in something, they are somebody who can actually you know, tell you the very core of your being and what you desire. Now in psychoanalysis, this is used because the idea is the psychoanalyst allows you to transfer onto them this, this idea. So you treat the analyst as a subject supposed to know. A lot of people when they're in psychoanalysis think the analyst knows their desires, thinks the analyst has some secret into their unconscious and can reveal their desires to them. The analyst knows me better than I know myself. And this is part of the process of analysis. The analyst allows you to do that. And then what happens is the analyst occupies that place and you start to fantasize about your analyst. They start to enter into your dreams. If you're a neurotic, whatever, you start to dream about your analyst, they start to be part of your, your fantastic structure, right? And then what the analyst does is very gradually they break the transference. They respond by saying nothing, just asking rhetorical questions and not responding as some all-seeing agent. Very gradually, you realize that the analyst doesn't have the secret. And you realize that there is no secret. And that the fantasy you have of oneness and wholeness and whatever it is that brings you into the therapeutic situation where you know something's gone wrong in your life and you want something that will fix everything. Um, that, that breaks and, and, you, and you realize that actually the, 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 the cure is there is no cure. The cure is there is no cure. You embrace that. And as you're able to live with that, you're able to kind of to move on. So how this works in Christianity is very simple. The role of the church is in a sense to be a liturgical structure upon which people project, transfer the subject supposed to know. 
they think that the the worship leader and the, the, the pastor and all of that are in a sense the 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 uh, the stand in for God. Now you don't think that consciously, but unconsciously people start to like relate to the church as if it's as if it's the stand in for God. That's why a minister can't give someone the finger in the car because it's not the individual, it's the church doing it, you know. This they become a symbolic symbolic embodiment of the of the divine. And then the idea is very gradually through the sermons and the music and the art, they begin to show that this structure doesn't know. They create a liturgical experience in which you are faced with your doubts, the complexity of life, the unknowing of existence. And as you experience this, you begin to accept it. So in other words, you think you're going to get a God back that fixes everything, that says everything is great, everything is wonderful, and, and, and has the secret. But the liturgical experience of power of theology is, no, you realize that that the liturgical structure just holds your suffering, holds your doubt, holds your unknowing, and doesn't answer it. And the, the music and all of that holds your anxiety, but doesn't answer it. And very gradually, the transference is broken, but not just with one church. If it works, the transference is broken for all churches. So whenever someone comes to me, comes to Icon, the community that I used to run, they come to me, they, they may think that, say, for example, I have the answer. They think that I have some secret knowledge to give, right? Well, I let that community think that. In fact, I create a liturgical structure that allows that transparency process to occur. And then what I try to do is very gradually create a liturgical technology that begins to show them that that's bullshit very gradually. The secret is there is no secret. If I'm unsuccessful, I break transference with just me, and they might go off and then they go off to some other guru, some other religion, and think that that's going to have the answers. But if it's successful, then I'm the last guru, right? That's the idea of power theology, is that, that it's the last church you ever go to, because it's the last church you ever believe in, because it's the church that breaks the idea that you should believe in any church. It takes on the transference and it, and it breaks up. It's the last guru.